Hi, this is Neil, and I want to go over the recording console signal flow. You should have a layout that looks something like this, and we'll interject it with some videos. So what we're going to talk about specifically is the Toft ATB. We want to make sure you understand the main components of signal flow, what we call those on a recording console, how they react within the recording system, and using industry standard schematics, starting you on your electrical path journey. We've talked about this in class, but just briefly we'll go over it again. We have two different types of analog consoles, the split console or the inline console. And what's different about the two consoles is where the monitor section is. And in a split section, we have an input where our microphones plug into. This signal is sent to the multi-track and we listen to the multi-track on the monitor section. And in a split console, those two sections are different. They're different areas of the console. And our master section would contain things like our stereo master fader or control room volume, things of that nature. And an inline console, we double the footprint by using parts of the console in line. So our input section and our monitor section are on top of each other. So an input section, it actually jumps down here to the faders, and then our monitor section is in line, and here's our busing and master section. So what we have is a Mackie 1604 analog console. There are tens of thousands of these sold, and you'll still see them around. So as a live console, we can do up to 16 channels, and we can send that to our stereo master fader here, what was called main mix. If we want to use it a recording console though, it is a split console. And what does that mean? Well, it means I can have up to eight inputs, but how do I hear those after the multi-track? And the key here is, notice it says track one, two, three. So we would plug our microphones in here, send those to the multi-track, and we would listen to our monitor section over here, track one through eight. This would be our split console. Whereas in this console, if you look, you can see we have two sets of faders. So that's a really good hint that it's an inline console. So as we go through the parts of the console, we'll talk about input section, but this part of the console and the fader will send to the multi-track and then the multi-track will come back on the inline section of the console. And here that is. And we would be able to send the signal to the multi-track on one and we'd hear it here in the monitor section. All right, so let's take a look at signals coming in the console. We have two choices to make right away. One is line input. And line input's gonna be around one volt. And those are things like keyboards, turntables, playback devices, external preamps, or the multi-track returns. Anything that is already around one volt is gonna be line level signal. It's a really robust signal. Anything else is gonna go through the mic input. So what will happen is before it hits our mic input, we have the chance to pad and that's lower the signal. So why would we do that? Well, a kick drum with a microphone close in might be too much signal and will distort the preamp. So with the pad, we can attenuate the signal at the console before it hits the mic preamp so that we can bring it up to one volt or line level without it distorting. You'll see pads sometimes on microphones, sometimes on mic preamps, sometimes on neither, and you have to choose a different microphone. So as we hit the preamp, we're gonna boost the weak microphone signal up to line level. Preamps can be part of the console. Most consoles will include something for phantom power, so we'll have a switch for that, and that would be for condenser microphones. On the Toft, it will be this top row, these pink knobs will be our mic preamps. You can see it says input gain. And you can see it says the line level, so we can choose. So with that buttons out, it's defaulting to the microphone level and it goes through the preamp. If we hit the line level, then we're choosing a different input path and would not go through the mic preamp. Starting at the top, we have plus 48 volts for our phantom power on and off and our mic trim. If we connect the line, we are no longer using the mic input, we're using the line input and this becomes a line level trim. We have a polarity switch to invert the polarity on that channel, such as kick drums or bottom snare mics. So we've talked about the mic line switch. So we, the console needs to know where do you want me to look for signal? And we tell the console either from the mic input, which is that line switch up, or 
which would then be for the mic input, or if we say, hey, look at the line level signal, we'd press that line level button. We then hit the EQ. This is going to be used for tonal manipulation. We can add high end, uh, we can add low end, we can cut rumble, things like that. We have a high shelving EQ with a switch for either 12K or 8K. It defaults to the 8K position. Semi-parametric high mids, semi-parametric low mids, and a low shelving EQ switchable between 120 and 60. It defaults to uh, 60. We have a high pass filter at 80 hertz, so you can see the low shelving and the high pass filter uh, all interact together. And then the EQ on or off button. With the EQ on, the EQ is engaged and now these will work. With the EQ out, the, none of the EQ is engaged. So important note there, there are actually four different types of EQ. We'll get much more in depth on that, but wanted you to be a little familiar with that. Then we hit our input fader. That is going to act as the faucet to let the audio through and it will generally sit at unity gain. Unity gain is zero dB. We're not adding or subtracting any gain. All the, the amplitude comes from the mic preamp. You can see that then it becomes the most important stage, the mic preamp. So our input fader will sit at unity and we'll send signal to that. When we mix down, we'll be moving those faders wherever we need to to make the most uh, cohesive mix. But for tracking, that's going to be our input fader. And that is the long fader. So in the console, it goes from the mic preamp through the EQ down to the long fader. We are now going to send signal to our multi-track. We assign through the pan bus assignment. We could assign multiple signals to multiple locations. We can assign multiple mics to one location. We can do combining through this area. Generally, we won't need this until we get to mix down. Bus assignments receive their signal on our bus assignments per channel. Left right immediately goes to the stereo master fader. If we do not engage the left right and we engage our bus assignments, for instance, seven and eight, bring these up and we would use our seven and eight, our monitor level and our pan assignments. We have solo for the seven and eight. We now hit the bus ACN. Also notice the summing amp, the active combining network is gonna combine everything that we sent to the ACN and put that to the bus output fader. That is one way we can record. The other way is the direct output. So when busing is unnecessary, this path is for direct access to the multi-track from the input channel. This is what we're gonna be doing. What's plugged into channel one on the console is gonna to go to track one on the multi-track. And there's our multi-track recorder. For our purposes, the HD24. After the multi-track, we then have the bus tape switch. So we either use to monitor pre or post multi-track audio. Great for troubleshooting, we want to make sure we're monitoring post multi-track. We always want to listen after what we've recorded. We then have the VU meters. VU is going to be an average of what we listen as opposed to peak meters, which tell us how close we are to exceeding the capabilities of the input. VU is going to be more how we hear. The monitor fader. Now the monitor, this is where we monitor the audio from the multi-track. So we mix the levels according to a cohesive mix we don't have to leave anything at unity. If we want a loud kick drum or a quiet kick drum, we would do this in the monitor path. So we would set our mic preamp to get as much gain without clipping, send that signal to the multi-track, and then use the monitor fader to put the kick drum at the level that we deem most appropriate to hear. This is our monitor section. So we have a monitor fader and a monitor pan. Aux 5 and 6 sends this monitor path to the headphones. With that out, you're receiving the mic pre long fader section. EQ to mon allows us to send the EQ section to this so we can EQ after tape and then a mute switch. So you can see here we have a monitor level and a pan control. So if this is our kick drum and our snare drum, we can put these monitor levels at whatever volume we think sounds nice. If we want to keep them mono, leave them mono. If we want to pan them, we can pan them. If we go backwards to where we were, we are at the monitor fader. Then we go to the monitor pan, which we just talked about. 
and then the monitor pan sends everything to the stereo ACNs. So the stereo ACNs, active combining network, receive their information from the pan, signals panned in the center to go to both ACNs, which is a phantom center. There actually is no center speaker, but sound sounds like it's coming from the middle image. That's a phantom image. Then we hit our stereo master fader. So one fader representing the left and the right master outputs together. And that's the level that go to the two track recorder. On the top, it's gonna to be the far right fader. This one fader represents the left and right combined. We have our VU meters and then our two track. So this is going to be either a CD burner, stereo hard disk recorder, software, whatever. This will be the final two track combination of whatever we're hearing. So we record individual kicks, snares, toms, vocals, and then we use that to combine everything down into a two track. Our switching bank. So on the top, this is, sounds like a really fancy section, but it's where we select the source for the control room speakers. And there's a couple different reasons why we do this, because in some con studios, Pro Tools feeds into the top, so you'd want to hit this to hear Pro Tools. Some studios, the two track feeds into here, so if you want to hear playback of your two track, you would hit the buttons here. And it looks like that, and I've tilted it so you can read everything. Two track digital return, two track one return, two track two return. In the respective studios, these will be labeled Pro Tools, two track, things like that. And then finally, our control and volume. This is gonna be the volume at which the engineer is listening to the playback. Our stereo master fader will be set. That's the level that's sending to the multi-track. And then if we wanna hear it loud, we would turn up our control and volume. If we wanna listen a little bit moderately or quietly, we do that through all the control room volume. And you can see here on the toft, the control room volume is labeled mon level. That is our control room monitor. And that's everything for SignaFlow.